this is Keith Leighton from County Lucky Stars and Empire Empire's Lonely State and Anna Flyway and Parting and Mount Oriander. And you are listening to As the Story Grows. <laughs> Welcome to the next chapter of As the Story Grows. I'm Brad Patton. Merry Christmas. I hope everyone is enjoying this holiday week before Christmas. This week, Keith Leighton joins the podcast. Keith is the founder of Counter Lucky Stars Records, as well as bands like Anna Flyaway, Empire Empire, I Was a Lonely Estate, and Parting. Most recently, Keith released This Is Not The Way I Wanted You To Find Out under the moniker of Mount Oriander, his new solo project. Keith is an important part of the emo revival, and I am super stoked to have him on the podcast. Keith and I chatted back in July. Keith talks about his love for Midwest emo, the need that led him to start Counter Lucky Stars, musical burnout, and label life during the pandemic. This was a super fun chat, and Keith and I kept chatting for almost another hour. That conversation will be up for our Patreon members at patreon.com slash as the story grows. As little as $1 a month will get you that extended conversation. Enjoy this week's chat with emo revival legend, Keith Leighton. Already winter, you say. To yourself again, turning the words over and over. As though they were as worn out. busy not bad but busy <clears throat> i uh right actually the reason i was late this right now a couple <laughs> minutes was my daughter came out of her room and she said dad i have a serious problem and i was like i don't know what's that and she said there's a mosquito in my room oh man so <laughs> <laughs> i have to try and get rid of that i understand that my kids yeah. have been waiting my kids have been waiting they're like what time does the podcast start so we can watch tv <laughs> <laughs> Um, mosquitoes have been crazy lately though. I don't know if you've had that problem. Yeah. Yeah. I've not, but my daughter, like she, her legs are just like welts of mosquito bites. It's been wild. Yeah. You know, it's weird because I feel like mosquitoes are like really attracted to like certain types of, I don't know, people or skin or whatever. And my daughter and my wife are both kind of, um, alabaster (laughs) pale. They're super pale. (laughs) So like, um, I think, um, they get bit pretty bad, but just in Michigan, at least the, um, there's actually been <clears throat> all these like news articles written about, um, I know this is the most interesting thing to do oh, to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyway, but, uh, <laughs> there's all these uh, articles about like how like historically bad mosquitoes are right now because the weather conditions just kind of like popped up perfectly. Mm-hmm. So like you, literally like for a week there, if you went outside, just even open the door they just like swarmed all over oh, so it's been crazy yeah so yeah <laughs> yeah this is this is my daughter's first summer we just moved back to dc after six years in philly so oh, cool. this is like my children's first year back here and the humidity and mosquitoes are so much worse here even oh, just right. that two-hour drive and <laughs> that's crazy yeah yeah that's just crazy dealing with the consequences like welcome to my child how old are your kids six and four Okay, yeah, so I'm not a younger than you, so yeah. <laughs> you, you got some milestones I haven't hit yet, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's fun times. Well, I'm excited to have you on the chat. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, I I think I, what was it? The Volume 4 Counter Lucky Star Sampler was my kind of introduction to your label and your band. Oh, cool, and, cool. And 
the emo revival as it were yeah. <laughs> um yeah that what's the opening track on there it's uh the the certain people i know track i think leads that one off and i was like oh, oh shit, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah it's bob <laughs> yeah that's why i put that first <laughs> try and get people to care and i was like wow look at listen to all these these bands that sound like bands i used to like yeah <laughs> i guess still like but <laughs> right right uh, so yeah it's cool to have you on um we'll just start you grew up in michigan i did yes yeah yeah i grew up in a uh, town called fenton it's um like 15 minutes south of flint okay and um yeah so it's i mean it really does paint that like proto midwest uh yeah you know uh landscape where like everything's you know pretty spaced out you have to drive to get anywhere mm-hmm. that kind of stuff and uh, you know it's beautiful <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome what got you into music um well <clears throat> i think well when i was in middle school i played trumpet um i was bad at it i was very bad <laughs> at it but i played trumpet and um i think that was part of it my grandpa had played trumpet so he gave lessons but that was music wasn't really a big deal um in my family it wasn't you know like you hear a lot of times where like musicians will grow up and their parents listen to music all the mm-hmm. time and you know they got into music you know through their parents and always had that like soft spot for stuff that their parents listened to and my parents were really big into music when they were younger but um not when they were parents and so like we really <laughs> didn't listen to a lot of music so it's kind of weird you know um and so the when i really got into music it would be through <laughs> um do you remember animaniacs yeah yeah so that's the kind of stuff i wasn't doing i was super young <laughs> and disney stuff and then kind of moved on and i was really really big into um video game music jrpgs and stuff like that and then the big turning point for me my brother um started getting into music and he got first he was like really into rap and stuff like that so i know a lot of like that old school rap nice. um but then uh he got into hootie and blowfish uh goo goo dolls our lady peace um that kind of stuff and then that's when i finally started like listening to music and really really getting into it yeah yeah. So you kind of, kind of through my brother and self discovery. That's cool. At what point did you start playing guitar or messing around with something that wasn't trumpet? Um, 16, I think I got a guitar when I was 16, um, for Christmas. And, uh, <coughs> I was very, <laughs> I was very bad for a very long time. <laughs> so <laughs> self taught, but like stubbornly self taught. So, um, you know, just a lot of like messing around and trying and, you know, failing horribly, which is, I think, a good way to learn an instrument. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was your, what made you choose guitar? Um, I have never really th- thought about that. I guess, <laughs> well, I mean, my parents didn't want me to get drums. Um, <laughs> and even though I do play drums and I did end up getting a drum set, it was not, uh, you know, definitely not their preference. Yeah. I think guitar because, you know, I think my, <clears throat> my favorite bands, you know, play guitar. And, you know, my favorite bands played music that I don't know, just it's appealed to me on guitar, you know, that those pretty melodies and um, yeah, it's just something I want to do. I'm not sure that I really gave it a lot of thought between guitar and bass. Yeah. I think when I first started playing, I didn't even know the difference between guitar and bass. Like that was, was really, really foreign to me at that point. Um, yeah. So I think that it was kind of like a default, you know, guitar is like a default. So yeah, <laughs> that's why. When did you start playing in bands? Um, well, I, I, I got a guitar <coughs> to, to start playing in bands. Okay. Um, I mean, we were very bad at first, obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I got a guitar and immediately tried to start writing for it. My friend, uh, my best friend who played guitar, he played bass in um, my bands in high school, and he also was the first bassist for um, Empire Empire, and he was also in 
and a flyaway. So he did a bunch of stuff with me. Uh, he got a bass at the same time that I got a guitar. And one of our other friends that we knew through uh, Boy Scouts played drums. And so we uh, started a band together. And uh, yeah, I, and it's interesting to think about like um, kind of like the history of something, something that always sticks out to me before we had a band and we were really trying to learn how to play stuff um danny's parents had this annual fourth of july party they they um they lived on a lake which was across the street from me but they lived on the lake so i'd ride my bike over there all the time <clears throat> but on the fourth of july they, they always had this annual party and we asked if we could play at it and this is we were definitely not good enough to play at something like that <laughs> and we played um it, um uh what was the the blink 22 album uh take off your pants had just yeah. come out so well, which one was it that had uh what's your age again was uh anima of the state anima yeah anima, anima had just come out <laughs> anima had just come out and we had that we had learned how to play that uh on guitar and bass and it was just the two of us playing and i just remember playing it opening the door and playing it and everybody like either ignoring us or like i'm sure cringing or whatever and and then after we played one song i remember uh danny's mom being like okay that's good <laughs> that's, that's enough for now <laughs> so you know that's what i think of when i when i think of you know learning stuff that's so funny like 182 and green day it's i feel like people are in one of those two camps as bands that like really influenced and I think everybody yeah, had, that's had a Blink or Green Day cover band. <laughs> yeah, I, and I was never really into... I, I really liked Blink, actually, for a long time. I was like a huge Dude Ranch fan. Yeah. Um, and Green Day, I did like, too, when I was first getting into stuff. Um, so you, I, that was at that, that, that time, too, where everybody was everybody was into that, you know, the Time of Your Life song. Yeah. So, like, that was, like, people's graduation song, and that was, like, people's everything. So, yeah, that was a really saturated market for that kind of funny time. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. How'd you and Kathy meet? Uh, we met through band camp. Yeah. In high school. Yeah. We met. Nice. <laughs> um, so I was, she was a grade above me. Um, although we're only a couple months different, but she was a grade above me. Um, and when we actually first started talking, this is really cool. And I, this should have been super red flag for her, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, it was at band camp. So it was like a week long, um, camp and it was a night where everybody was watching movies but i wasn't interested in watching the movie that they were watching <laughs> so i was not playing magic the gathering but i was sorting a deck and like making <laughs> cuts or something and that's when she first talked to me i remember i think that's <laughs> the nerdiest thing not even playing magic but like you know <laughs> making a deck just fiddling magic. with the cards yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> but yeah and then we we um and because we were different um in different grades I actually stayed in band for uh i was going to quit band after that but then stayed in band for an extra year because that was the only class that we could be in together and then she ended up um, having knee surgery hmm. um over the summer a year later this would have been her uh senior year this was my junior year and so she actually ended up dropping out of band and I was already at band camp when that happened. And I was like, I'm not doing band anymore. So I <laughs> quit band after when I got back home from band camp that year. <laughs> uh, that's funny. At what point did you two start playing music together? Uh, I started teaching her how to play uh, bass when we were in high school. And actually, this is really funny. So she didn't really start really playing guitar until she was in college. Um, but for for my this i was in a band called said the girl in high school and uh we had this like final show although at the time we didn't know it was going to be our final show and our bassist had left for california was doing had moved out there for um to join something called the young americans which is this like uh sing acapella like singing group it's like really <laughs> dorky uh <laughs> singing group or whatever which is cool you know it's cool yeah. that he went <clears throat> but he had left and we had this show booked and so we had all of our friends um, play bass for us for like various songs. So my brother had played bass for a song. Um, one of my friends who I was in bands with later played bass for a song, et cetera, et cetera. And I taught Kathy how to play two of our songs. And she was actually at work. She worked at Hallmark okay. <laughs> and she left work, played two songs, like drove like 15, 20 minutes to get to the show. It was at this barn. Yeah, I grew up in, you know, a small. <laughs> 
small town is at this barn shout out to adam shoemaker if he ever listens to this and uh <laughs> and uh she played two songs on bass and then left and went back to work <laughs> oh man <laughs> that's so funny that's so funny so was it college i don't know if you went to college or not but playing did, college yeah. okay college rock uh you started playing like Anna Flyaway. Yeah, well, actually, um, yeah, I was in I was in a couple different bands in in college. I was in a band called Sea Defeat Sparrow, which is this like Taking Back Sunday esque band, which is you know fun to be. It was yeah. I, I would I maintain that that band is still my most popular local band. We were really popular locally, but outside of that, you know, not so much. <laughs> uh, we had a pure volume account that to date us you know pretty bad yeah <laughs> um yeah but, and the anna flyway started at the end of college and then you know kind of transitioning out of college so yeah and then and kathy went to a different college night than i did okay. i went to mission state and she went to alma and uh they're about like i don't know, like 45 minutes to an hour away so you know it wasn't really possible to do i mean i guess it was possible but we didn't do a band in college so i had bands gotcha. with other people What drew you to that that sound, that kind of Midwest emo sound? Um, I love really like slow and mid tempo, like pretty, you know, like this like beautiful um, guitar work. Just that like usually like in a major key. Um, I don't know. This is like the interplay between the guitar work and and all those other things. Just kind of like really. I guess it kind of reminded me of, you know, like JRPG music and stuff that I grew up listening to. I don't know. It's just like a pretty um, driving sound. And then it could turn super dynamic with like a wall of distortion. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it is it is super emotion laden. And, you know, when you're when you're a teen and when you're young, you know, you feel everything so much more than you do, you know, as an adult. And I think that, you know, I really connected with that. And uh, I don't know. And it's just like once it got a hold of me, I, I mean, I've never really played anything else. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had an awareness of bands like Christy Front Drive and Mineral, which are really the two that come to mind when I listen right. to like Empire. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those are huge influence, especially Mineral. Mineral is like one of my favorite time yeah. bands of all time. Uh, so, yeah. And it's funny how I got into it was because um, do you remember uh, Fuel? The radio rock band fuel yeah yeah they had shimmer yeah yeah, yeah and like a uh, hemorrhage in my hands <clears throat> i actually still like that band but um we went to go see uh when i i think i was like 16 around the time and that's when shimmer had was like a new radio single mm -hmm. and this is kind of interesting my so we went to a show at a local club here called st andrews it's in detroit <clears throat> that's where we go to shows mostly and um it was me Kathy, Danny, my, my best friend who, you know, ended up playing bass for so long for us, my brother and his girlfriend who ended up being his wife. So all these people are still people very much involved in my life. Yeah. Anyway, we went to go see this show and it was um, and Sam, I am opened up for it, which is a really random pairing. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so <clears throat> later I actually ended up. Um, well, anyway, so I, I, we ended up buying the CD. And then at that point, this would have been, you know, like 98, 99, whenever it was um, l like liner notes were a really big way of figuring out, you know, which bands back, oh, yeah. back then. And so <clears throat> I looked it up and I remember I can't remember if it was in the liner notes or if it was just online or whatever. But um, the guitarist from Sam I Am also played guitar in Knapsack. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into Knapsack and the Knapsack was on Crank and they uh, or they, they had released uh they were on alias records whatever but they had a comp on crank that don't forget to breathe comp and uh mineral was on that and just a whole bunch of amazing bands and that was sort of my 
you know, like my breadcrumbs getting into that movement. And so it's all because of fuel that I, That's you so know, that kind of ended up here. <laughs> uh, I love that. That's like a fun story, a fun yeah. find your way. Was there a scene happening either locally in Detroit or surrounding Michigan area or that you were aware of a band in this groundswell of this emo sound happening again? Or was it just, I like this and this is what we're playing? Well, okay, so when I was, <coughs> so that first band that I was in, which was called So The Girl, um, we would play these shows in Flint. There's that all-ages venue there. Um, actually, it still exists today. It's called the Flint Local 432. And it, I really consider that to be, um, I guess I consider that my hometown venue. In fact, we had the very last Empire show there, and I wanted to like concretely have it there because that venue means so much to us and the people that run it. And it's just like, kind of has that community. So when I was in high school, we were playing shows at the local and we played, there's an amazing local band called Kibro the Collective, which um, Counting Lucky Stars actually put out um, their last record on vinyl, um, like retroactively years, years later, because mm -hmm. it was such a, you know, a great album and really, you know, a huge album in um, the Flint scene. And uh, really, really, you know, it has that all those classic mid '90s um, leanings, and it was a band, you know, in, in the '90s. Um, anyway, so we would play shows with them, and we would play shows with um, other bands in the area at that venue in particular. And then there's this one show that we played that I think really changed my life, and the rest of my band played it too. And and I think that that really helped get them into it. We played with. Um, uh, Do you ever hear of a band called Counterfeit? Yeah. Yeah. So we played with Counterfeit and another amazing band called Benton Falls, which we ended up reissuing yeah. their record on vinyl too. Um, and yeah, so we played that show. It was them and us and Kimber Collective. And it was just like this, like, I don't know, still one of my favorite shows we ever played. And so I just never stopped playing that music. And then I went to college and, you know, it had moved the, the term emo had mostly moved into that mall phase. Mm -hmm. Um, so like My Chemical Romance, Taking Back Sunday, something corporate, yeah. that kind of stuff. And I was still trying to play, um, you know, the kind of music I play now. So I remember putting all these ads up like online or talking to people being like, oh, I love like American football and Penfold and Mineral and not really finding anybody to bite. It was like really dead at the time, which is why I ended up being in a Taking Back Sunday-esque band, which was a lot of fun, you yeah. know, but maybe not quite true to my roots. But I never stopped playing. And really, when Empire started, people like to talk about, um, I think people really like to, who weren't, you know, really involved in there, like to say things that like, oh, this, this type of music never died, but it very much died. Yeah, it, it was, was very dead. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and so when we were playing that, so when Empire got, we actually started doing shows, and even when Anna Flyway did shows, um, hardcore and grind core was those are like the huge things in michigan and so we would play all these shows and it would be all these like grindcore and hardcore <laughs> bands and then we would play and it was a complete mismatch and it was like that for tour just like, like a really days. long time too yeah <laughs> and i think you know it kind of worked out where there you know there were just a handful of bands doing um what we were doing um and then as a label we kind of connected those those dots we kind of like pull them all together. I even like to say that at that point, it almost felt like cherry picking because there was not really any other label doing what we were mm -hmm. doing. And so we look, oh, Joie de V, they sound like mineral uh, and, and they're from Illinois and like uh, football, etc. They sound like Rain Maria and they're from Texas and perfect future. They sound like, you know, I mean, and so you can kind of just pull all those. We just kind of pulled them all into one umbrella and independently of that. And then also um, at some point joined, there's all this crazy stuff happening in Philly, um, yeah. you know, with like Elgernon and Street Smart Cyclist and then Snowing and High Tide and all these other great bands. And then, yeah, it just sort of organically grew, you know, from that. So, but it, yeah, like I said, I mean, I know that people, you know, love, like to make that claim, but to me, it very much was a dead art form. So, yeah. Yeah, there were. I, I remember hearing um, the My Heart to Joy record, mm -hmm. uh, Seasons in Verse, and being like, oh shit, this is a throwback. Right. And then right. finding the label sampler and being like, 
oh, there's a whole scene of this again. Right. What brought this back? Yeah. And I think I think it was, <clears throat> you know, it was tying things together. And then Austin, top shelf, uh, yeah. played a, a big hand in that and sort of went for cover and at some point tiny engines and um, you know, a couple of labels like that. And at some point, you know, once it starts happening and then it has this weird effect where now I think and this is something that's really strange to me, but now people lump our bands from that generation in a hundred percent with like no distinction with like the original bands like yeah. mineral and, and get up kids and knapsack and all that stuff. And it's really funny to me because there's like a, you know, there's a large amount of time that went by. We were influenced by those bands. And so, yeah, history has a really funny way of like reshaping things. I think. Right. Yeah. What led to you uh, starting the label? Well, there's a long story and a short story, and I'll give I'll give you the shorter story because the long one is um, pretty much <laughs> we couldn't find anybody who wanted to put our, our music, and so we just decided to start doing it. Um, we actually had a uh, <clears throat> we had a we were going to do a split with a band called, Empire was going to do a split with a band called Look Mexico or our friends Look Mexico, who they kind they kind of like bridged that like gap where they had like some emo influences, but they kind of had that real indie leaning as well. Anyway, we ended up playing shows with them and becoming friends with them. Matt from Look Mexico sang guest vocals on um, an idea, one of our songs. Um, anyway, we were going to do a split release with that and it ended up falling through. But through that process, um, the year the rabbit seven inch was born, um, our good friend who that we still work with, uh, Andy Malcolm, who runs a label called Strictly No Capital Letters in England, um, was pretty much was like, hey, you know, we can we can I can release a record for you, uh, but it would be, you know, best if you could find a label in the States uh, to do it. And I thought, OK, well, this is already half price vinyl for us. We couldn't find yeah. anybody anyway, so we'll just do it. And so we put that out. And then we started touring and meeting all these amazing bands who also, you know, were kind of, you know, no one was really paying attention to them. And they're like, well, hey, we put out a record. We'll put out your record now. And it just kind of snowballed. It wasn't yeah. something that was like an intentional thing. It just kind of, you know, kept happening. So, yeah, it was like, and here self we are 14 years later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was like self preservation. We got to do mm -hmm. it to get our music out there and mm -hmm. be like, your band will do it too. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> where'd you come up with that name? Um, you know, I think <clears throat> in the early days of emo, there used to be like like a really funny stereotype with stars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you might remember that. And like we had this um we made this so the Giuliani theory, if you remember that band, super okay. cheesy. Um, and they had like all these cheesy songs. And so we at one point joked about doing like this um joke band called the july project theory because they had all these like ridiculous um you know and and we had a song called the stars make me cry which well, is all like hypothetical this wasn't an actual thing but we were just joking around about that <clears throat> and i don't know just kind of like that that you know that imagery of stars and early emo and just the whole phrase count your lucky stars just being grateful for being able to do anything at all mm -hmm. you know that common idiom and kind of just putting that into our mantra and feeling like lucky that honestly that anybody cares about what we do so yeah what was your distinction with empire when you started that versus anna flyaway uh well <clears throat> actually um anna flyaway was, was my main band yeah. and it was a solo project at first and then we turned it into a, a full band so i had recorded all the parts which had been at that point two guitars bass and drums and then we added a drummer a cellist and a keyboard player and then um we we wrote a couple songs, but mostly learned the songs that um, that I had written, and then I was re we were recording it, and my my one of my other good friends who recorded some other stuff other stuff before, and this was just like, you know, in the basement type stuff. But he he couldn't record anymore, and uh, I didn't want to abandon the um, the project, so I was like, hey, I'll, I'll record it. I'll learn how to record it. But to learn how to record, I was like, I should do something so Anna Flyway doesn't sound bad. And then I started Empire for that reason. To do like a solo project, 
to learn how to record so Anna Flyway didn't sound bad. And then Anna Flyway ended up breaking up or, you know, they the kind of read the tea leaves that it wasn't going to be a band anymore. And uh, this at that point, I already had an EP already. And I was yeah. like, hey, might as well start using this. So, yeah. So that was my solo project. Empire was and Anna Flyway was a full band project. And then, you know, kind of transitioned into that. And then the same guitarist, Kathy and, and bassist, Danny, who were in Anna Flyway. So, OK, well, we might as well keep going. And so then we did that and found a new drummer. That's awesome. Where where did why that long name Empire Empire? I was the loneliest state. <laughs> yeah, my biggest regret in my life, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I ro- okay, so the name Empire Empire, I was the loneliest state. It's I in that point I was into like overly wordy um metaphorical based things, which is definitely is not my thing anymore. But that's <laughs> what it was. Um and Empire Empire was like it was meant to be the courage of you know, going after and chasing your dreams. So do you, you know the, um, you know, the term manifest destiny and like yeah. go West young man or whatever. And they always use like exclamation points for that. So that's kind of why I attach those exclamation points, like to give that importance. And then the parenthetical part, which is really the downfall of the name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a lonely estate was kind of how I felt. I thought of myself at the time, like I had been in a million bands and none of them were, really successful and i was like okay this isn't gonna matter either so i might as well name it something incredibly ridiculous and then of course that's the band that stuck you know and i could have been <laughs> like my heart to joy um and they actually had a longer name in the beginning it yeah. was like my heart to joy at the same tone or something like that i can't <laughs> remember what it was but like they ended up dropping it to just my heart to joy and we really could have dropped it to empire empire and really that's how everybody refers us to anyway yeah. but i think i was like stubborn at that point um and i had clung to it and then you know it, it stuck at some point it was you know it would have felt weird to change it so then you get tour posters with the world is a beautiful place and i'm no longer yeah, afraid yeah, to die yeah. <laughs> We did tour together. It was pretty <laughs> that's ridiculous. That's great. Let me ask you about Ribbon. Oh, what, yeah, uh, yeah. What, what inspired you to do a graphic novel <laughs> along with the record? Okay. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm glad you asked about that. Um, <laughs> well, okay. So in a former life of mine, a couple times, I worked in libraries. Um, I was a librarian um, most recently until the beginning of last year. Um, and for one of my classes... I'd always like comics and, and things like that. Like I was huge into um, Kelvin and Hobbes. And I just always liked all those old like DuckTales and Little Nemo and all that yeah. stuff. Um, I hadn't read a lot of graphic novels, but then um, for an assignment for my master's degree, this would have been around 2010 or something like that. Um, <clears throat> we had to do like a collection development task. And part of it was on um, a graphic novel section. And I just like I um, Jeff Lemire had this like really incredible um, series of graphic novels. Um, And now he's really popular because I think he does um, his own stuff. But he also worked with either, I don't know, Marvel or DC or whatever. And actually on Netflix, he has that sweet tooth. Um, Anyway, he he had something called Tales from the Farm that happened to be at the library that I was at. Um, And I read it and I just fell in love so much with that art form. I love that it's just a, such an interesting medium yeah and um the lyrics i was writing at the time especially were what i termed as hyper literal they were super specific and there was no you know to the best of my knowledge they're 100 percent fact based and i did like a lot of research for my own so like when when i was writing lyrics for um you'll eventually be forgotten I did a bunch of, um, I like would call everybody involved in before I would give them my memories. I would kind of like talk them through and see what they, you know, cause everybody's memory is a little bit, you know, subjective. And so we would kind of come, you know, talk about things and hash out details. Um, and I just, since I love graphic novels so much, I felt like it would be a pretty easy to translate that the literal nature of the lyrics Mm -hmm. onto paper and then ben sears who's an immensely talented artist and we had played a lot of shows um he was in a band called mountain asleep and xerxes at at later um just really good drummer and good guy and i you know asked him if he'd be interested in doing um you know the graphic novel and 
he agreed to it. And I ended up um, to th- make things as accurate as possible for him. I had sent them this like giant packet, like this zip file of um, pictures of what I looked like at that, t- that time of that mm-hmm. period or pictures of what Kathy looked like at that period or whoever was involved in those songs and locations and stuff like that, because I wanted it to be as, you know, as accurate as possible. So, yeah. And that, that's sort of how that came to be. Yeah. It's super cool. I think, I think it came randomly in like, I ordered a pack of like 10 or 20 CD mystery box or something from you. And it came in that and it was like, Oh cool. Yeah, I we, did not know this existed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I think that's, it's actually still not available on um, online, which I think is, a, is a, something I've been meaning to, to correct for a long time, but we submitted it um, for distribution through for like an, an ebook or whatever. And mm-hmm. something had gotten messed up and they rejected it. And it was towards that time that we were taking a break as a label and so it just didn't seem important at the time. And now yeah. I've been meaning to get it back because I think that it's a really cool piece of work, but I don't think a lot of people know that it exists. So, yeah, 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 yeah. super cool. Yeah. You mentioned taking a break at the label. Why? Like just putting the label to the side for a little bit. Well, so when Empire broke up, this was around 2016. I think I was just honestly really burned out from everything. Mm-hmm. And I thought <laughs> and, and it was just kind of like the candle burning at both ends when empire started and the label started um i think they're mutually beneficial they really helped each other out and then at a certain point it became it became the inverse of that and um nine times out of ten i would choose the label over the band because i knew that other people you know they were counting on that and so it kind of like ate into my career as a musician and um yeah, this was it's just a lot of work to, to run a label and yeah. it's a labor of love. And I didn't want to shortchange that. So like I think I could have kept doing it, but it would have become something that I wouldn't have, you know, been proud of or recognized it. And so when when Empire was done and I was we were tired from touring and you know that is sort of taken its toll, everything just sort of came to a head. Um and so I decided you know that that old adage if you you know if you love something let it go and if it's meant yeah. to be it'll come back to you so that's what happened it, it came back to me but it took a while and, you know and i i think i'll never you know i you know i think i approach it a little bit differently now um but that was like my entire life at that point you know because we were doing the label we were touring all the time we were you know that was it and i think you know it's good to have like a little bit of separation from that kind of stuff. And so this time around, I think I have a little bit healthier uh, mindset than I did last time. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, you know, same thing with empire. I never wrote a record that I feel um, that we were just like phoning it in. And I could have kept, we kind of kept on going with that too. Um, but I think when you do something like that, both for the label and for the band, um, it kind of cheapens everything you do and kind of tarnishes the stuff that you do beforehand yeah and so for the purity of it i you know i left and that's sort of what dropped you know brought me back yeah with 14 years of the label and playing music how have you reacted with like the changing landscape with like the prominence and rise of streaming and like the return of cassettes versus vinyl and like cds basically be non-existent anymore (laughs) yeah i mean it's funny because when we first put out empire like the first um when our first ep i mean cds were the main medium i think you know i mean i've always loved vinyl and when we put out year of the rabbit it wasn't really a popular thing to to be doing you know vinyl records and if you look at the first handful of like the first 10 or 15 releases it was mostly cds you know, because that was that was the medium at the time. But I think, you know, first of all, you, I mean, you have to adapt to the times. And so I've always loved vinyl, but man, it's super expensive. And especially right now, I mean, <clears throat> it's gotten super popular now. And with all the COVID issues that we've had with yeah. breaking production chains and stuff like that. I mean, we put out, we sent a record out in, I want to say like, March or April, and we're not going to get it back until November or December, Damn. which is really difficult. You know, that it's between it's between that and like the rise of popularity. It's finally 
it may have seemed like it reached vinyl reached mainstream like a while ago but i think like a, the adaption from like major labels and stuff takes like a really long time and so i think you have now covid production chains and it's all also being clogged up with a bunch of you know reissues and major label vinyl stuff and mm -hmm. it, it definitely you know it's another challenge that we're kind of looking to face but I don't know you just have to adapt at the time streaming is amazing and terrible at the same time it should yeah. pay a lot more you know <clears throat> but at the same time um man it makes discovering other artists so much easier it makes hearing because like back in you know back in the day you know how we were talking about like liner notes and yeah it was like it was really difficult to track down and find new music it was really hard and, and I, you know i think that i can't say that one thing's better or worse because i think when i found something i gave it a lot more tries before um giving up on it or or loving it or whatever um but here it's so much easier to discover new stuff because algorithmically you can listen to something on spotify and it's like hey you should check this out and then sometimes it's like wow i love this and then yeah it can become something that's your new favorite band so i don't know it changes the game but you know, I think it also gives a lot more power to artists and smaller labels, you know, being able to reach out and kind of not gatekeep the stuff that, you know, we might not have had access to before. Yeah. Yeah. One of my, I think the closest we get to liner notes is on Bandcamp when you purchase a record and the band is like, check out our friends records too. And you're yeah, like, okay, uh, cool. Yeah. Great. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I kind of still like those, those liner notes. So for our albums, we still do. Yeah. Kind of more extensive ones. But yeah, I mean, I miss that. I miss that. Well, speaking of like streaming and COVID and changing, I like 2020 was just a nightmare for everybody. You guys still continue to put out records through the year. I know on Bandcamp Fridays, you guys were doing name your own price for a lot of your digital records on Bandcamp. Yep. How did you guys weather that storm and, and find <clears throat> a way to keep keep releasing music and keep going? Yeah, and actually, it's funny because that was it was a it was a terrible time because uh, towards in 2019 i was pretty miserable with the job that i was at i was a librarian and i liked my job but i had a, an awful boss uh to the point where it was like mentally deteriorating you know you know like my i was just in a you know just in a bad place for that and so i started like <clears throat> and i had realized that the label was something that i was coming to love again so i started rebuilding it slowly over that time period and um signed another signed a new band called thank you i'm sorry mm -hmm. um that was the first band back with um the new kind of the relaunch of the label quit my job at the beginning of 2020 and then all of that happened and man so i was dealing with rebuilding a label at the same time as um you know dealing with what everybody else was with covid so we put um <clears throat> a lot of money into this uh into the the first thank you record um uh well i guess the second one but anyway we put a lot of money into that record which ended up coming out in in august and we had hired like a um an expensive pr and they were um thank you was going to do, be doing all these support tours you know being a small band that's the, the yeah. really really important to have that kind of stuff uh, and then all of a sudden that was gone and i think a big part of it too was you know, when it first started, I mean, everybody was like, oh, there's going to be like a two week pause, right. which is laughable <laughs> at this point. Remember that? But yeah. Yeah. I know. So like and it just kind of like I think like the um, the uncertainty of everything made it even more difficult, because I think if you you can identify a problem and you know what it is, you can give it a name or you can give it like a like a length or something, then, you know, you can sort of adapt things. But everybody was sort of operating in the dark, you know, mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> so we started doing something called, I think something that really helped us. And this is before the label like really ramped up. And I actually stopped doing it because I, the label had ramped up enough where I ran out of time. Um, but I was doing something called recount your lucky stars. Yeah. yeah which I saw um, on Twitter. Yeah. 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 And so every day I was going back and like kind of telling the oral history behind, you know, chronologically through mm -hmm. our release. And I think that got a lot of people be uh, you know, nostalgic and me like, oh yeah, I remember, you know, this release or this band or whatever. And I think that kind of helped bring some people back into the fold. And I got back, I got up to like, I don't know, like the looking at my, I have like a list of all the records that we put out on the wall. And I think I got to like the, the thirties or something like that before, or maybe even forties before um, it just got too much to, to, to keep up with. And at some point I'd like to, you know, continue doing it, but I just don't have time right now. But yeah, I mean, I think that and just like kind of, you know, adapting to the times as much as possible. Um, we played a bunch of uh, Facebook live shows for our artists. We had a bunch of those on or or various streaming things. Yeah. And it went in waves, too, because when the, when it first happened, <laughs> I think um, every when everybody was forced home, everybody was like, oh, wow. Art is great. Here are all these amazing albums that are coming out, and I'm really supportive of them. And then I think um, when August came around, people hit this like, um, I guess it was sort of like a collective wall. You yeah. know, I think people were just super burned out from COVID and, and just life in general. And I think that like uncertainty hung over everybody. And so I think a lot of stuff that came out in August or late summer and early fall in that whole period, they really kind of fell, just kind of fell to the wayside because people were just Mm -hmm. trying to live their life and figure stuff out which is really difficult for us because we were trying to push this album and um <clears throat> you know there obviously there's a couple breakthroughs things but by and large i think the music industry and i'm um, film and all that stuff it just kind of like fell flat tv yeah. all that's the entertainment industry so we we one thing we tried to do was thank you i'm sorry had a um uh we tried to like do some things to promote it so they did um crossword puzzles word searches um stuff like that to kind of like you know show that we, we were adapting to the time and yeah you're stuck at home but here are some fun things you can do you know and i don't know how successful it was but i mean you just you just kind of adapt the best you can and, and keep going yeah you know? yeah for sure well you guys i mean you put out amazing records last year the records you put out this year some of my favorites the camp trash record the kitty hawk right, yeah. and guard um and and the parting record you talk about this uh emo revival super group uh <laughs> how'd that come about <laughs> It, it's sort of a i hope people realize it's like a tongue-in-cheek thing i'm not like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i mean i bet you there are people who don't realize that but <clears throat> yeah um well the funny thing was so in the interim of me not playing music um i would occasionally write songs and occasionally do things um but mostly things kind of sputtered and, and failed or whatever so i had tried starting a bunch of internet bands that is to say, like, I'd record like a track or whatever, and I'd send it to somebody else. They would do a track. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of times I would record a track and send it to people. We all agreed to do it. And then nobody did it, which that that just happens. <clears throat> yeah. So when I was putting parting together, I was like, who do I know that I love playing music with that would actually do the parts? And so I thought, you know, then that's kind of how I landed it with. Gooey, they had done a bunch of stuff with. They were actually the last bassist for Empire, and we had done a bunch of stuff together. Uh, ben was in a, another early, and he, Gooey was also in Dowsing, which was you know an early Count Your Lucky Stars band. Uh, Annabelle was one of the original uh, Count Your Lucky Stars yeah. bands, and so Ben and I, all these people I had toured with all the time, and we kind of talked about playing music together. A bunch of them, in fact, all three of the members of um, Parting 
filled in for Empire miscellaneous times and uh Ben even played bass and guitar depend on different tours. So we <laughs> so we used them for a lot of stuff. <laughs> so we, anyway, we just started like writing music and just sending it back and forth. This was in 2018 or something like that, 2019. Then we got together in 2019 and recorded the music for it right before um my um my son was born. And I wanted to get it done before my son was born because, you know, there's always a period of time after oh, yeah. you got to readjust to having a new child and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, we recorded that in 2019 summer of, and then, um, and then, and then, you know, what, then I got kind of used to everything and I, I was actually just about to start doing vocals for parting when uh the pandemic hit and that uh. that pushed things back too but um yeah i mean that just this started because we're a bunch of friends that yeah. um you know want to play music together and and actually the original drummer um his name is josh michael he lives in atlanta this was before he wrote new music and he ended up not having a, the same kind of internet syndrome for bands like that just not, ended up not having a bunch of time and so um i was in a band in flint which was close to to me and where i was working at the time um as a librarian um one of my friends was played drums and and when when josh couldn't do it we we're like hey let's who do we know that actually do it again and we we asked john and he was into it but then we realized that we we're all relatively close to each other so like john and i are in michigan goo is in illinois and ben is in ohio so now we can it's harder to do but we can actually physically get together and so we started off writing a bunch of our songs online, but we usually get together to kind of like, you know, put it together and like hammer it out. I was in a mood and you knew I was growing glares Like they were darts But yeah What's, what's the future of the label look like you guys uh put out the parting record what's what's the future look like uh i mean our, our next year is pretty much booked already we have a lot a lot of full lengths a lot of stuff that i yeah. actually kind of thought would come out this year but you know things take a long time and COVID obviously throws a lot of wrenches into that kind of stuff so we have a lot of um a lot of stuff coming a lot of full lengths which is that's the real meat of stuff and the mm -hmm. kind of the funny thing about this year is even though it's july we haven't released a full length yet yeah yeah so like it's really weird the closest i guess was parting had an ep it was like that awkward length there between like a full yeah. length and an, an album um and then we had that you know the boyfriends and kitty hawk discographies but those aren't albums so yeah, yeah next year will be full of a lot of albums um camp trash will have their album expert timing will have their album thank you's got a new album um i have a solo project called mo oriander that that's been done for a while but we're in the mixing phase so i finished recording it but um actually the same time pretty much that i finish parting but parting we decided to do first or whatever yeah. um you know just and a bunch of other bands some bands we haven't even announced yet. Um, Tiny Blue Ghost, we announced that we signed them. They've got a full length already recorded that's being mastered now. Um, yeah, so it's going to be a really busy year next year, and it'd be full full lengths. Which, like I said, that as a label, it's so much easier to market a full length, and that's where yeah. the real money comes from. You know, EPs are nice, but you know, you know, there's no one really connects with an EP as much as an album, and um, you know the the you know the biggest profit margin is in albums and so that's going to help us kind of keep moving forward and i painted it shot there were reasons of not speak for fear of saying them out loud we give bodies to all ghosts Well, we, um, it's funny, actually, 
so parting is playing we parting has never played a show yet we've never played a live show because you know we had planned to <clears throat> you know play a couple weekends <clears throat> before the album came out or when the album came out but then COVID happened and so yeah. that that happened um so we're playing our first show it'll be either at fest which is a pretty big first show yeah or like maybe like a weekend be before that or so to like get kind of a warm-up but i'm touring down um down to fest um so go everybody else in the band can't get off enough time to tour yeah. um but we wanted to kind of tour around it so my, warren franklin who I toured with all the time and empire and he also played guitar for empire for a long time um when kathy couldn't um so his band which i'm actually playing guitar for him on that tour he and i are going to tour down to fest as mount oriander which is my solo project full band solo project and then at fest parting we'll play a show and then we'll tour back <laughs> nice so yeah so that'll be fun so i mean that mount oriander we're booking a tour um and there are no songs out that i can show people so it's kind of <laughs> in good faith i hope people come out based on like you know the previous stuff that i've done yeah but yeah i mean um next month we've got i'm not sure when this will you know actually be released but in august we have um uh chat wasted which is um jacob from perspectives um solo project and this is like really gorgeous album so that's actually the first full length that'll come out this year and it kind of ranges from like bon Iver to like the beach boys like pet sounds and all this really cool vocal harmony stuff and kind of like discordant like minory to majory stuff um is yeah, so that'll come out next month you know we've got but the way this year lines up we'll have a release every single month which i'm not sure if we've ever had a a year like that or not i'd have to kind of look back at our history but it's kind of a cool little kind of yeah. cool little thing so yeah cool. just you know keep it on keep it on parting recorded a music video um that's pretty much done so we'll debut that at some point which is the first music video that i've ever been in despite <laughs> empire being a band for over 10 years yeah so it was really weird recording that i felt like super self-conscious because i you know i'm singing in it or whatever so <laughs> It's like, I don't know, it felt weird. But yeah, so yeah, lots of exciting things to come. Thanks for listening to As the Story Grows. Our intro music was written and composed by Jeremy Hunt. The As the Story Grows theme is by Bob Nana. If you like what you hear, subscribe wherever you get your podcast and give us a rating and review. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can join us at patreon.com slash as the story grows. Be a part of our community and join the ongoing conversation over on Discord. If you enjoy this episode, share it on social media with your friends. Much appreciated, and thanks for listening.